Well, good morning, church. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name's James, and I'm the, the pastor here, and it's fantastic to be with you. Um, this week is week one of a pilot course that we're running called Emotionally Healthy Spirituality. And I am so excited what God is going to be doing over this next term and over the year. We're in a season of discipleship, and this teaching really is unpacking what is going on, discipleship, and going deeper with Jesus. Busy doing church? Have you thought this before? Sometimes, oh, I'm just so busy at church. But we are called to be the church. Have you spent periods of your Christian life pretending everything is fine when you're actually falling apart inside? I know I have. You see, as long as we look and behave in the right way at church and keep the messy fallen areas of our life out of sight, then there's this sense that we're okay. But Jesus called us to live a life of honesty and integrity where he wants us to be in a community where we can be honest with how we feel. This church is an honest church. We're going to get more honest in terms of how we're doing, and again, Don't worry your emotions on your sleeve telling everyone how bad your week's been. But for the people who are you strongly connected to, it's being honest to say, look, I'm not okay. My life's a bit of a mess. We don't want to just sweep things under the carpet and look like we're perfect. How about this? We no longer measure our spirituality by how much we do for God, but how much we love others. We no longer measure our spirituality by how much we do for God, but how much we love others. Ouch. Huh? That, 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 the Holy Spirit really spoke to me on that, and I'm sure he's probably for you as well. Is gosh, how much do I love others? Because if I'm a Christian, I'm following Christ, then it's not what I'm doing for God, it's who I am because I am a Christian. I'm a follower of Jesus. How much do we love others? I want you to imagine a church where people serve out of a deep love for Jesus. Imagine a church where maturity and health are prioritized over activity. Imagine a church where everyone is living out their relationship with Jesus. Imagine a church where every person is experiencing transformation beneath the the surface of their lives. Imagine a a church where every person is committed to learning tools to love others like Jesus. Doesn't that church sound amazing? And it should. Here's why. Because it's how God intended his church to be. You see, the more you read the Bible, the more you realize that the church was God's creation. He loves the church. And he knows the church can be phenomenal. You just look at how much the the church is talked about, particularly in the New Testament and by Jesus. And not only that, we are the bride of Christ. The church is the bride of Christ. Jesus doesn't want a bride who is awful. He wants a bride who is beautiful and wonderful. And so that's what we're called to as the church. And yes, Are we still broken? Do we make a mess of things at times? Yes. But here's the thing is we want to be a church that seeks after Jesus and as a result actually becomes more like the bride of Christ that God intended. In 1 Peter 2 through 9, um, this is what it says. You are a chosen people. You are holy priests. You You are royal priests, a holy nation, God's very own possession. That is how God views us. We're the church, we are priests, we are a holy nation. Now, over the last year, I've been sitting under Pete Scazzaro's ministry, not in person, but, but online and through books and through videos. And the Holy Spirit has been challenging me so much, along with the rest of the leaders, as we've worked through some of the material. And I get to repeat the course as we go through it again. But here's the thing is, I'm not doing repeating it with a sense of, oh, I've done this. Don't really want to, but I need to leave the church in it. No, I am genuinely excited about doing it because I'll tell you what, the, this year that I've been running through this material, God has been speaking to me so much. 
The Holy Spirit has been prompting my heart. But after 12 months, I can say some improvement, but a lot more to go for myself. And so as I go through this course, two, three, four, however many times, I'm going to be excited each time because when you start at the beginning again, you realize, okay, God, you're doing good things in me, but there's a lot more. We're never going to get to this stage where you're like, we've made it as a disciple. I am done. Uh, Just take me now, God. You know, we are always on that journey of discipleship. And so I'm really excited about doing this course with you. And um, I just want to really this morning share that excitement with you initially. Now, this course does not provide some revolutionary information that you've never heard before. It's not some secret code that unlocks the Bible and you're like, wow, no one has ever thought that before. The truth is it's really simple. It just looks at what Jesus says. It looks at Jesus as the model. And it simply encourages to slow down and rest in God's presence. Now, if you're a Christian, you'll have heard Jeremiah 29.11. It's that verse that's often people's favorite verse and it's thrown out, uh, you know, as people know it off uh, for, for memory. For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good and not for disaster to give you a future and a hope. We know that bit, but do we know the next few verses? Let's read those, 12 to 14. In those days when you pray, I will listen. If you look for me wholeheartedly, you will find me, and I will be found by you, says the Lord. You see, God has good plans for us, but he says you only discover those when you sit at God's feet and say, I'm at your feet, God. I want to learn from you. So we take the first bar, oh, God's got all this great stuff, but I'm not really too bothered about hearing that from you, God. I just want it to happen. And God says, no, it, it, it's two parts. I've got great stuff for you, but you need to follow me. You need to sit at my feet and listen to me, be with me, and then I can unpack the glories that I have for you. So I'm going to invite you to join me on this exciting journey of seeking God in this series ahead. Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much um, for the simplicity of this message that you sent your son Jesus to die on a cross for us, to take all our wrongdoing from our shoulders when we acknowledge our brokenness, our flaws, our sin, and ask for your forgiveness. And so God, as followers of Jesus, asked for forgiveness, been redeemed and restored. We want to go deeper in our relationship with you, Jesus. Would you still and soften each and every heart here, in person and online? And would you speak to us? Would you, Holy Spirit, minister to our hearts And encourage us to go deeper, not out of a sense of obligation, but out of a deep longing to know you better. Amen. Amen. So you'll notice on the the book, there's an iceberg. And the picture of an iceberg is the symbol of EHS, emotionally healthy spirituality. And it represents how we're all made up of different layers that exist beneath the surface of our daily lives. See, the thing about icebergs, and most of you will have heard this by now, is we can only see 10% of the iceberg. 10% is above the surface of the water. And the truth is it's the same with um, the external activity in our lives. Our decisions and behaviours that everyone can see represents that 10%. Unless you know someone really intimately, you've got an idea, okay, I can, I can look around in church and say, yeah, I can see their 10% and their 10%. Yeah, all good. But notice 90% of the iceberg is beneath the surface. And that 90% represents what's really going on deep beneath the surface of your life. See, this is the thing, the other thing is that are your hidden motives, your fears, 
your jealousies, your sadness, your anger. This is what Jesus wants access to. See, most Christians in most churches, and I'd include myself in that, and I include City Church in that, and this is what we're trying to work on it, is it's fair to say that for most, most of the time we engage in a lot of things like worship, prayer, Bible studies, and fellowship. Brilliant, biblical, godly things that we need to. And so we do all that. But if we stop there, we're missing so much more that God has for us. You see, we can do the worship. We can come on Sunday. Who's ever been here? Come on Sunday and you can worship and it can be amazing. Um, And it looks as though, wow, they're on fire. They're doing really well. And then what happens the next day with your mates or when you're at work? People at church aren't seeing that. They're not seeing some of the, the, the stuff that is not of Jesus. But church people don't know that, so we can hide that. But the truth is, it's not about hiding our weaknesses from each other. Because God knows. And God wants access to the 90%. I don't. I don't want access to the 90% of your lives. I don't want you having access to my 90% of my life. What I want, what Jesus wants is he wants the access. And so we're going to spend the rest of our time looking at King Saul from 1 Samuel. And so this is the the first chapter in the book, and we'll be looking at on the Wednesday. And Saul is a case study in emotionally unhealthy spirituality, unhealthiness. Don't look to to Saul for, for your direction. Saul was the first king of Israel. He was chosen by God. He was anointed. He was a strong leader. He was very successful as he led God's people, Israel, in battle. In other words, on the surface, King Saul looked like the man. He looked like he was seeking God. But underneath the shiny veneer of his life, Saul was emotionally unaware. He was a man of action, but he lacked a deep, contemplative life with God. He wasn't aware of his iceberg. He didn't see his fears and insecurities in the 90%. He just focused on the top 10%. And so we're going to run through um, 1 Samuel. If, If you really benefit from having the Bible open when you go through it, do so. But if not, just listen. And we'll pick out one of the key scriptures. So if I'm honest, most of this message for the next 10 minutes is just reading the scripture and adding bits to it. So one day Samuel said to Saul, it was the Lord who told me to anoint you as king of his people, Israel. Now listen to the message from the Lord. This is what the Lord of heaven's armies has declared. I have decided to settle accounts with the nation of Amalek for opposing Israel when they came from Egypt. Now go and completely destroy the entire uh, Amalekite nation. Now the Amalekites were a wicked, violent, barbaric tribe who had persecuted Israel. God says you need to wipe them off the face of the earth. Back to our reading. Then Saul slaughtered the Amalekites and he captured Agag, the Amalekite king, but completely destroyed everyone else. Saul and his men spurred Agag's life and kept the best of the sheep, goats, the cattle, the fat calves and the lambs, everything in fact that appealed to them. They destroyed destroyed only what was worthless or of poor quality. Notice Saul destroys the army, but he doesn't kill the king. And what he did was he kept the best of the spoils of war, the sheep, goats, cattle, calves, lamb. God said, destroy it all. But Saul said, can't destroy that, it's too good. Saul said to God, I will do, I'll do half of what you ask, but I'm going to keep some stuff. And then, again, the Samuel, who is a prophet, and a prophet is just someone who God ordains to speak his words to people, particularly seen a lot throughout the Old Testament of God sending prophets to speak to um, the broken nation of Israel. 
And so Samuel said, then the Lord said to Samuel, I am sorry that I ever made Saul king, for he has not been loyal to me and has refused to obey my command. Samuel was so deeply moved when he heard this that he cried out to the Lord all night. Samuel loves the nation of Israel, God's chosen people, and God says, they've messed up big time. Samuel is devastated. It's important you grasp Samuel is gutted, he's devastated, he's broken by the news. And then, this is where we see Saul's true colours. Early the next morning, Samuel went to find Saul. Samuel's got to tell Saul about what a mess he's made. And someone told, when he was looking for Saul, someone told him, Saul went to the town of Carmel to set up a monument to himself. Did he catch that? Saul, victorious in battle, he goes and sets a monument up to himself for how good he's done. To honour his victory. And Samuel arrives. Have you ever had a moment like that where God has asked you to do something and you've done it and it's amazing and you're like yes I nailed that did you see John did you see what I did oh yes and then someone who's just been watching comes and says after a word that God shared with them James you no no it wasn't you it was God and all of a sudden you're you go from Oh, oh, I made a mess of that. I made a mess of that. It became about me and not God. I know I have. I know I have. So when Samuel finally found um, Saul, Saul greeted him cheerfully and said, May the Lord bless you, he said. I have carried out the Lord's command. So Saul still thinks, yes, nailed it. And Samuel, who's gutted, Here's this, and he's like, are you serious? If you've done what the Lord said, back to the verse, then what is all this bleating of sheep and goats and the lowing of cattle I hear, Samuel demanded? Yeah, it, it, it's true. The army spurred most of the sheep, goats, and cattle, Saul admitted, but they, were, but they are going to be sacrificed to the Lord our God. We have destroyed everything else. It's okay. I ignored what God said, but we're going to sacrifice them to God. Then Samuel said to Saul, stop. Listen to what the Lord told me last night. Saul's still jubilant. What did he tell you? Thinking how good Saul was. And Samuel told him, although you may think little of yourself, Are you not the leader of the tribes of Israel? The Lord has anointed you king of Israel, and the Lord sent you on mission and told you to go and completely destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, until they're all dead. Why haven't you obeyed the Lord? Why did you rush for the plunder and do what was evil in the Lord's sight? I I don't get it, Samuel. I, I obeyed. I carried out the mission God gave me, and I brought back the king but destroyed everyone else. And then my troops, he's distancing himself, but my troops, they took the best of the sheep, goats, cattle and plunder, and, uh, and they're going to sacrifice them to the Lord. It wasn't me. I did what you told me to. Uh, my troops did something different. No, Saul, you're over the troops. They work on behalf of you. Now, Here's the verse that we are going to put up, and this is key. This is what Samuel replied. What is more pleasing to the Lord, your burnt offerings and sacrifices, or your obedience to his voice? Ouch. What is more pleasing to the Lord, your burnt offerings and sacrifices, or your obedience to his voice? Listen, obedience is better than sacrifice, and submission is better than the fat of the rams. 
Rebellion is as sinful as witchcraft, and stubbornness as bad as worshipping idols. So because you have rejected the command of the Lord, he has rejected you as king. Then Samuel admitted to, uh, Then Saul admitted to Samuel, Yes, I have sinned, I have disobeyed your instructions and, and the Lord's command, for I was afraid of the people and did what they demanded. I was afraid of the people. I wasn't afraid of you, God. You told me what to do, but then the people would be like, Why have you just killed all this great livestock? You shouldn't have done that. Why did you kill the king? You could have used him as a bargaining chip to show off to other nations that we have the king in captivity. See, Saul was concerned about the way the people of Israel and his army saw him instead of God. The reality is Saul is shallow. He's unaware of the interior of his life and he's not paying attention to God. All of us have that false self, don't we? when there's that immature, childish aspect of our soul that we try and hide from others, but we can't hide from Jesus. Saul was chosen by God. He was gifted by God. He was anointed by God. But because he failed to pay attention to what was under his spiritual life, the 90%, God rejected him as king. Is there any element you can relate to this? I can. See, my default as a pastor is to charge your head. Let's do this. Let's do that. Let's do some teaching. Let's start this new initiative. And I get so busy and then I realize, oh, oh, I've been actually neglecting my time with God. And what happens then is if I've done that for a long time, I am simply working in my own strength. And there's so much that's gone wrong. I want to ask that of you. What is the element that you will just get on and do in your life, your business? Is that your work, your family, church, pursuit of money, football? That you allow to distract you and distract you and and take away the silence of you being able to listen to God? You see, we all have a soul inside. We, have a, we all have a soul inside of us. I, I, this is my northern accent here. Soul, not as in, yes, we've got a spiritual soul, but we all have a, a king soul. Uh, we all have a little mini king soul in us, don't we? That if we neglect looking at God, that little mini king soul starts to take, to, to rise up with a sense of arrogance, which distracts us from God. Just as I come into close, let me say, are you making room in your life to just listen to the Lord? You see, the truth is, is we can all go to church. We can go to church for your whole life. You can know your Bible. You can read Christian books. You can love times of worship. But it doesn't guarantee you will grow in your relationship with God. It's key. It's part of it. But all of that is still largely on that surface, that 10%. It's collective, it's community. Jesus wants to go deeper into the unseen things. He wants you to be more loving, humble, approachable. In a sense, he wants you to be broken, acknowledging that he's in charge. And he wants you to be teachable. Friends, I want you to hear the good news here today. That we serve a gracious, generous God. So when the Holy Spirit is speaking to you, there isn't this sense of God's wagging his finger saying, you messed up, you, I saw that, you messed up, you're in trouble. No, he, he comes by more like the side of you. You made a bit of a mess of that, didn't you? It's okay. Let's work through that. Let me show you the true things of my character and how I want to bless you. So that's what emotionally healthy spirituality is. We're learning how to go from being unhealthily uh, emotionally spiritually 
and how to become healthy in our emotion, emotional spirituality. Yes, it's a journey. You may be in a good place, you may be in a rubbish place, you may be somewhere in between. The truth is, is you're not there at the end. There is more, there is more, there is more. Can I encourage you, would you join us? Would you join us as a church? Don't stay away, don't just ignore stuff and you're seeing people going deeper. You know when someone's on fire for God, literally you can see a glow around them. They're like, whoa, that guy loves Jesus. Can I encourage you, don't start to watch all the lights coming on in people's souls. That's your spiritual soul. While you're just kind of, oh, yeah, don't look at my 90%. So that's what emotionally healthy spirituality is about. Um, our time has, uh, has come to an end, so we're not going to finish with, with any, any worship. Um, what I want to do is just say, would you join us? You're part of the family. If you're new here this week, you're a student, for example, you've picked a good time to come. If God's speaking to your heart, join us for the second part. Join us for the midweek. Again, I can't do anything or say anything that makes you want to get engaged and to come on the midweek to look at getting the material and working through. Because I'm not going to force that on you. Listen to your heart. Is God, is the Holy Spirit speaking to your heart? Think, and you've, you've got a very clear sense of, gosh, I want that. Well, eight Sundays, eight Wednesdays, and 20 pound is a tiny price to pay to go deeper in your relationship with Jesus. So um, let me pray as we, we, we finish. And um, yeah, Father God, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for the power the power of your gospel. That's why we're here. Because we love you, Jesus, but we want to love you more. And we can't do that in our own strength. We can only do that in your strength, as weird as that sounds. We've got to receive more of your love by being at your feet in order that we can love you more and be your disciples to reach out to those in our communities to share you with them. I just pray you would bless this time, this season ahead. In your name we pray. Amen.